Right, let's turn our attention now uh, to the launch of hundreds of free qualifications on offer to boost skills and jobs at a time when, goodness me, an awful lot of young people in particular are desperately in need of those skills and qualifications to get back into work after losing work during lockdown. Gillian Keegan is um, Education Minister for Apprenticeships and Skills and joins us right now. Good morning to you. Good morning, morning, Julia. Good morning. We got you. Great. Um, Now, um, this is a new uh, launch you're announcing today of uh, hundreds of free qualifications. An estimated 11 million adults now having the opportunity to gain those new qualifications for free. What sort of qualifications are they and what sort of jobs will they qualify them for? Oh, there's a whole list of them. Um, In fact, I've got a list of here. Anything accounting and finance, building and construction, business, environment, child development, nursing, medicine. Um, science, public services, teaching, um, transport, very, very, lots and lots, I, obviously everything digital as well. Lots and lots of different areas, horticulture, forest, for, forestry as well. So there's about 400 and odd courses. Um, but in addition to that, we're also introducing skills boot camps, which are sort of intensive 12 to 16 week courses that will be rolled out across the country in different things. Things. I mean, the one I went to the other day was on electrical installation. So uh, to start that journey to become an electrician. So the most important thing is they're really valuable courses to um, the employers and, and the areas that we have a, quite a bit of uh, skills gaps of course, as I well. Mean, so look, we, we, if you do one of these courses, you'll definitely have high value. But we know one of the reasons why a lot of these young people are going to need these courses, is of course, because they've lost their jobs as a result of all those hospitality and other uh, industries that have been shut down. And lots of people asking, you know, for a lot more help uh, to try and get their businesses reopened as, as a result of that. Um, let me let me ask you about uh, some of the other big stories in the news today. We've seen the uh, resignation uh, announced, well apparently notice given yesterday but announced today of uh, Boris Johnson's most senior black advisor. Uh, this is Samuel Kasumu who's the number 10 special advisor for civil society and communities. Uh, he's decided to leave his post um, quite coincidentally or not, on the day that we had the Race Commission report saying there wasn't institutional racism in this country uh, that has been widely criticised uh, by uh, many who have argued that there is a systemic problem of racism in this country. Do you know if these things are related? Um, no, I don't. And it's definitely a personal matter um, for him. I haven't heard any more than that. I'm sorry. But um, I don't know if they're related. But in terms of the report itself, I think the most important thing is to actually read the report. There is um, you know, 285 pages. It's got a lot of detail, a lot of detailed uh, data in there as well. Obviously, the 10 uh, commissioners have spent a lot of time working on it. They spoke to thousands of people. Um, so, you know, I think the most important thing is to take that seriously and the work that they've done seriously, uh, which is what we'll be doing. It's an independent report, but the government will be uh, looking at it, reading it and coming back on the recommendations that they make. OK, well, again, well, we've seen a number of race reports in the past, haven't we? And uh, I think David Lammy, the Shadow Justice Secretary of the Labour MP, has pointed out, well, you know, he commissioned it. He did a report. It was commissioned and then none of the actual recommendations were enacted. A lot of people are saying, well, look, you know, a bunch of people are put onto this uh, commission who say there isn't institutional racism. They've said that in the past. And then they produce a report saying there isn't institutional racism. What a surprise. Um, some people are saying this is this is just a whitewash. What do you say to that? Um, well, I, I think that'd be very unfair and um, disrespectful, actually, to the commissioners, uh, the, te- the 10 people. If you look at this, 10 people, I mean, many of them from ethnic minorities themselves, with, with a lot of experience in this area, and they've also spoken to thousands of people, so I think it'd be disrespectful of them as well. In terms of David Lammy, his report did uh, outline 33 recommendations, all of which we're working on implementing. Uh, the Ministry of Justice is doing that, so he knows that there's many of those that are being worked on and and, you know, will be implemented as well in terms of the criminal justice system. Um, so, yeah, I think, I, and actually the report did have a lot more to say on that as, as well. Uh, but those recommendations um, are still being worked on and still being implemented. Um, you, I mean, obviously, with your responsibility for apprenticeship and skills, there's lots of talk about education being the key in this race report uh, and also issues with in terms of uh, jobs and access to the professions, the higher paying professions. Um, do you think that there is a racial disparity in in educational outcome in people going off to university or going on to apprenticeship schemes or the others and getting decent jobs decent careers where they can progress and help their families progress is there one based on any ver- any any claim of institutional racism or do you think all of the differences can be explained by other factors 
not all can be explained by other factors, but, you know, for example, uh, they showed that the outcome for educational outcome for boys, Bangladeshi boys who were in London differed very much from uh, those who were in Bradford, or indeed that um, black Caribbean uh, boys, the outcome was very different from black African boys. So they did have, you know, I think you go, if you go down to the granular detail, and that's actually one of the things I think is useful about the report, they get down to detail, they recognize that there is racism, there is disparities, there are inequalities, and we absolutely have to have policies to address them. But quite often, these are th these are done at a very sort of what, what the, the point the report makes at a very high level BAME, everybody's BAME. Well, actually, that what they're saying is that that label is too is too um, high level. We need to get down to look at differences in um, different ethnicities, different race, different gender, different parts of the country where people face those real barriers, real uh, inequalities, and don't get access to the best jobs, the best education, don't get access enough to apprenticeships, and which are a brilliant tool to be able to, you know, increase your uh, lot in life and the social mobility tool. They're fantastic. I know I did one myself. They are brilliant but not enough people are getting access to them so definitely it's making lots of recommendations we need to take those very seriously um, and education is always a way that people improve um, their their and, well their equality and how much how important is education how important are schools and their role in terms of educating young teenage boys and indeed perhaps boys as young as primary school age uh, about how they uh, relate to uh, other boys or indeed other girls in particular we've got Ofsted now investigating safeguarding issues in private and state schools we've got children's commissioner uh, getting involved the NSPCC helpline uh, being set up uh, to follow on from the everyone's invited website site where thousands of our allegations have been made anonymously about uh, so-called rape culture in some of our schools. How much is it a school's job, a teacher's job, to educate young teenage boys about uh, their sexual behaviour? Well, it is a part of the teacher's job, but clearly it's not only their job, it's parents and, and other adults as well and other role models um, but we have changed the relationship health and sex education um, curriculum in schools so we did a lot of work following earlier um, reviews of this and we implemented that from May 2019 it's become compulsory uh, from September 2020 so there has been some changes and that does put a, a lot of onus on schools to talk about relationships healthy relationships the importance of consent and and all of those other factors that are now part of the curriculum and that's relatively new um, but that's something that I think is important and it is in a, a school's role you know children spend a lot of time uh, at school and and you know it is a, a place where you know education happens so uh, I think it's important also to include relationship um, and sex education um, education as well. All right can I just ask you again as an education minister it's a, it's a younger age group involved but these are, are uh, uh, younger early years settings in nurseries and uh, and, uh, and, and and children's groups um, and the government yesterday the education department quietly updated guidance for early years groups and um, th this is this is a tweet from the department for education um, just as in all other early years settings singing is still permitted at parent and toddler groups but in order to make sure it can happen safely and to minimize the risk of the spread of covid Parents should not join in. The person leading the group can sing. The babies, the children can sing, but not the mums or dads in the group. Um, has this country gone completely and utterly stark staring insane? I mean, obviously what we're trying to do, as with all of these things, is as we're sort of vaccinating our country and getting towards the end, um, hopefully, of uh, many of these restrictions, which, you know, uh, you know, we would have thought were insane, actually, uh, a year ago, if they someone had told us we'd be doing half this. Um, but, you know, I, I think what, what is important is we're just trying to minimise everything, take a cautious approach. Um, we know that aerosols and singing you know still not allowed in, in churches you know singing it has been something that has been uh, restricted so um i guess it's just trying to get the balance that you know so mums and babies sing, they the can go to the group them. they can talk to each other but they can't sing I and mean, even if they sat two meters apart i can see from you on the video i think you agree with me that this is madness i think it's cautious i think it's it's cautious, cautious. and that's really the That's way the watchword now, isn't um, it? Cautious. You know, from now, <laughs> it's true, but as you get to the end and you can see the end in sight, 
all of us are being cautious. We don't want to risk any of this at all. We definitely you, want to get back. You think to it's, us. you oh, agree yeah, with me. You think it's bonkers, don't you? No, I just think it's cautious. Honestly, I do. And I think I'll do anything. You know, we've now spent a year under the most unbelievable restrictions obviously it's been devastating what's happened to our country we've done you know we're really in a fortunate position where uh, a lot of people have been vaccinated across yeah. our country and that's rolling out brilliantly and we're all super okay. super and you, you'll say that. you'd do anything but it is now would, time to just finally would you do anything would that include carrying your own personal medical records and having the right of anyone on the uh, the door of a pub to have a right to know your personal private medical records and have a carrier vaccine passport would that be included in the anything you'd do well, to be honest, I think they are looking at this, right, and looking at the pros and cons of it, because there are, are pros and there are cons. Um, you know, if you said to me it was my way of getting on holiday, then then that would probably change uh, my mind, and I probably would. Um, you know, the report, I think, comes back on the 5th of April, and we have to weigh up. It is a tricky subject, because there's a lot of people who, you know, it's it's legally quite tricky as well. So, um, you know, that, that report will come back on the 5th of April, but... Uh, you know, there are some pros and there are some cons, that's for sure. True. All right.